what thresholds should be used for the various antibodies that could cause fetal anemia to trigger a referral for further investigation or monitoring. An anti-D level of greater than 4 international units per milliliter but less than 15 international units per milliliter correlates with a moderate risk of HDFN or hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn and an anti-D level of greater than 15 international units per milliliter can cause severe HDFN. Referral for a fetal medicine opinion should therefore be made once anti-D levels are greater than 4 international units per milliliter. An anti-C level of greater than 7.5 international units per milliliter but less than 20 international units per milliliter correlates with a moderate risk of HDFN whereas an anti-C level of greater than 20 international units per milliliter correlates with a high risk of HDFN. Referral for a fetal medicine opinion should therefore be made once anti-C levels are greater than 7.5 international units per milliliter. For anti-K antibodies, referral should take place once detected as severe fetal anemia can occur even with low titers. The presence of anti-E potentiates the severity of fetal anemia due to anti-C antibodies so that referral at lower levels or titers is indicated unless the fetus has only one of these antigens. Once referral to a fetal medicine specialist has been made for assessment of pregnancy at moderate or high risk of hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn, the value of subsequent quantitation of anti-D and anti-C levels is doubtful. Further testing is however required at 28 weeks for the development of additional red cell antibodies. Caution is required however if there is a history of a severely affected previous pregnancy even if the antibody levels are low in the current pregnancy. For such cases, early referral to a fetal medicine specialist should be made so that an expert assessment of risk can be undertaken. For these women, ultrasound monitoring may be required even with low antibody levels. Anti-K titers appear to correlate poorly with the severity of disease with fetal anemia occurring at titers as low as 8. Once detected, how often should antibody levels be monitored during pregnancy? Anti-D and anti-C levels should be measured every 4 weeks up to 28 weeks of gestation and then every 2 weeks until delivery. Although anti-K titers do not correlate well with either the development or severity of fetal anemia, titers should nevertheless be measured every 4 weeks up to 28 weeks of gestation then every 2 weeks until delivery. For all other antibodies, retesting at 28 weeks is advised with the exemption of women who have a previous history of pregnancies affected with hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn when early referral to a fetal medicine specialist is also recommended. For antibodies that could potentially cause problems with cross-matching or issues with the availability of appropriate blood, discussion with the blood transfusion service is required regarding the frequency of antenatal testing. This may depend on the type of antibody as well as the likelihood of requiring blood at short notice. How should pregnancies at risk of fetal anemia be monitored? The cause of the alloimmunization, relevant past history, and pregnancy outcomes should be ascertained in order to generate an assessment of risk of HDFN or hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn. If the fetus carries the corresponding antigen for a maternal antibody, which is capable of causing fetal anemia, and if the antibody levels or titers rise beyond the levels, then the pregnancy should be monitored weekly by ultrasound. 
specifically assessing the fetal middle cerebral artery peak systolic velocities or MCA PSV. Referral to a fetal medicine specialist for consideration of invasive treatment should take place if the MCA PSV rises above the 1.5 multiples of the median or MOM threshold or if there are other signs of fetal anemia. Fetal monitoring is required once anti-K is detected. The cause of the alloimmunization should be ascertained. For example, inadequate or omitted anti-D prophylaxis or a previous blood transfusion. Details of previously affected pregnancies, particularly IUTs, and the gestation at which they were commenced, neonatal anemia, gestation at delivery, and the need for exchange transfusions or phototherapy should also be obtained. This information enables a risk assessment of the pregnancy to be made. Ultrasound monitoring should commence once there is a moderate or severe risk of fetal anemia. If the fetus is antigen positive, it will be at risk of anemia and the pregnancy needs to be serially monitored. Pregnancies at risk should be monitored on a weekly basis, looking specifically at the MCA PSV or middle cerebral artery peak systolic velocities. Other signs that might suggest fetal anemia include polyhydramnios, skin edema, and cardiomegaly. Although the risks of fetal anemia are well known for anti-D, anti-C, and anti-K antibodies, and weekly monitoring is advisable, the risks for other less common antibodies is difficult to precisely quantify. A reasonable approach would be ultrasound monitoring every 1-2 to two weeks using the MCA PSV. Needle cerebral artery peak systolic velocity monitoring is predictive of moderate or severe fetal anemia with 100% sensitivity and a false positive rate at 12%. If monitoring of the MCA indicates anemia, MCA PSV greater than 1.5 multiple of the median, fetal blood sampling or FPS, and possibly IUT or intrauterine transfusion are indicated. Monitoring with MCA PSV should be used with caution after 36 weeks as its sensitivity for the detection of fetal anemia decreases. Further management should be discussed with a fetal medicine specialist if MCA PSV levels are normal despite high or increasing antibody levels beyond 36 weeks of gestation. The risk of fetal loss following an FBS is 1-3% to but is higher if the fetus is hydrophic. The procedure is carried out under continuous ultrasound guidance with facilities for immediate analysis of the fetal blood hemoglobin and hematocrit. The risks and benefits of IUT or intrauterine transfusion should always be discussed with the woman who should be made aware of the consequences of untreated severe fetal anemia, for example, high drops, preterm birth, perinatal death, severe neonatal jaundice and kernicterus, as well as the risk of neonatal exchange transfusion. If fetal transfusion is required, what type of donor blood should be used? Red cell preparations for IUT or intrauterine transfusion should be group O, low titer hemolysin, or ABO identical with the fetus if known and negative for the antigen or antigens corresponding to maternal red cell antibodies. Blood should be IAT or indirect antiglobulin test cross-match compatible with maternal plasma and negative for the relevant antigen or antigens determined by maternal antibody status. K-negative blood is recommended to reduce additional maternal alloimmunization risk. It should also be less than 5 days old and incitrate phosphate dextrose or CPD anticoagulant, cytomegalovirus or CMV0 negative, irradiated and transfused within 24 hours of irradiation. 
blood packs should have a hematocrit packed cell volume or PCV of 0.70 to 0.85. Blood for IUT or intrauterine transfusion should never be transfused straight from 4 degrees Celsius storage. Intrauterine transfusions or IUTs should be performed only in fetal medicine units that have the requisite invasive skills and appropriate perinatal hematology expertise. What are the implications for the mother from red cell antibodies? For antibodies other than anti-B, anti-C, anti-C, anti-E, or anti-K, maternity staff should liaise with their local transfusion laboratory to assess and plan for any possible transfusion requirements as obtaining the relevant blood may take longer. How often should pregnant women with red cell antibodies who are at high risk of requiring a transfusion, placenta previa, sickle cell disease, and etc. be tested? Pregnant women with red cell antibodies who are assessed as being at high risk of requiring a blood transfusion should have a cross-match sample taken at least every week. Current British Committee for Standards and Hematology Guidelines require a sample no more than 72 hours old for providing compatible blood in pregnancy but do allow a deviation to the three-day rule for individual cases such as high-risk women with placenta previa without red cell antibodies where weekly samples can be taken as long as a risk assessment is made and recorded in each individual case. In high-risk women with red cell antibodies, where a sample every 72 hours is not feasible, a sample should be taken once a week, and if transfusion is required, a new sample should be taken immediately to exclude new antibody development. If maternal transfusion is required, what type of donor blood or blood components should be used? red cell components of the same ABO group and RHD type and that are K negative and CMV negative should be selected. If group ABO identical blood is not available for group A, B, or AB patients, group O blood should be used. Pregnant women and women of childbearing age who are RHD negative should receive RHD negative blood. The transfused blood should also be K-negative. An IAT cross-match must be used if the woman's plasma contains or has previously contained clinically significant red cell alloantibodies. For planned antenatal transfusions, CMV or cytomegalovirus negative blood should be transfused. Screening for CMV or cytomegalovirus should not delay transfusion in an emergency situation. Should RHD negative women who have anti D or non anti D antibodies receive routine antenatal or postnatal prophylaxis? Anti D immunoglobulin should be given to RHD negative women with non anti D antibodies for routine antenatal prophylaxis, for potential antenatal sensitizing events, and postnatal prophylaxis. If immune antidy is detected, prophylaxis is no longer necessary. Discussion and liaison with the transfusion laboratory are essential in determining whether antidy antibodies are immune or passive in women who have previously received antidy prophylaxis. Requirements for blood. What are the logistics of obtaining blood or blood components for the woman, fetus, or neonate? 